Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about health care topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello and welcome. Today's presentation, Stroke Warning Signs and Prevention, is presented by Dr. Jack Rose and nurse practitioner Maria Nunes. Our first presenter is Dr. Jack Rose, a neurologist, neurointensivist, and co-medical director of the Stroke Program at Washington Hospital. And now, please welcome Dr. Jack Rose. Thank you for that introduction, and good afternoon. I'm pleased to be able to speak to you today about stroke, a common, serious, but treatable and preventable illness. Stroke is a very large problem today, um, worldwide, but also in the United States. In America, there are close to 800,000 strokes every year. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death. Um, that translates to one American dies every four minutes from stroke. Uh, we currently have well over five million so stroke survivors in the, in the United States, and stroke is the leading cause of long-term disability in adults. Stroke causes uh, a lot of financial uh, problems as well. It's estimated that stroke costs the United States upwards of $33 billion a year. 20% um, of stroke survivors are still institutionalized uh, at three months after their stroke. Uh, up to a quarter of both men and women uh, will die after having a stroke within the first year. Um, only 50 to up to 70% of stroke survivors will regain their full functional independence after stroke. Uh, and certain uh, populations uh, are at higher risk of stroke than others. For example, African Americans have more than 50% uh, incidence of stroke than Caucasian populations, and twice as many strokes as people of Asian and Hispanic heritage. In terms of African Americans and stroke, like I've said, the incidence is higher than in white Americans. Black Americans are also uh, at risk for suffering more physical impairments after stroke, are twice as likely to die from stroke, and have much higher incidence of risk factors for stroke than other ethnic racial groups. Women are also disproportionately affected by stroke, uh, and stroke is a deadly disease in women. Stroke kills more than twice the number of women in the United States than does breast cancer. And women are more likely than men to die after a stroke. And even young women can be at high risk for stroke, especially certain women that smoke or take oral contraception, for example. The combination of, of such can increase the risk of stroke by almost 20-fold in one study. Well, what is a stroke? Well, a stroke is a brain attack. So unlike a heart attack where the heart is damaged, um, a stroke is injury to the brain from a blood vessel problem, a, a loss uh, of blood flow to the brain. So we describe it as being a brain attack. Um, it's also a medical emergency. And if you suspect that you or someone next to you um, or a family member, a loved one is having a stroke, you need to call 911 immediately and not wait to see if things get better or, or drive you, yourself or your loved one or neighbor to the hospital. More specifically, talking about stroke, a stroke, like I said, is an injury to the brain from a disruption of blood flow to the brain, either from a blocked artery or a broken artery. And the brain tissue that is normally supposed to be getting that blood flow uh, will be injured and can die unless the blood flow is restored or the bleeding is stopped quickly. There are two main types of strokes. 
There is ischemic stroke, which is the most common kind of stroke. We also describe that as being a blocked artery stroke. So 80% of strokes are from blocked arteries or are ischemic strokes. And that's when an artery uh, in the brain or in the neck is blocked, often from a blood clot that stops the blood flow to a portion of the brain. And when portions of the brain do not get blood flow, uh, those parts of the brain can die and swell and cause uh, the brain not to function well. This is a cartoon illustration showing you a blood clot in one major middle brain artery that's stopping the blood flow to one portion of the brain. Ischemic strokes can be small or they can be large. This is a picture test of the brain that we call a CAT scan taken years after somebody has had a small blocked artery stroke. That yellow arrow that you see pointing to the dark area on the CAT scan represents the area of the brain that was damaged permanently from lack of blood flow. That dark area should normally be gray and represents loss of the brain tissue in that area. But this is a small stroke. This person probably was able to recover after their stroke with little uh, leftover disability, but maybe still some disability. However, strokes can be quite large as well. You see in this picture, in this CAT scan, the dark area is very large, and it's almost half the size of the brain. This is a large blocked artery stroke that could easily lead to death or permanent severe disability. The second type of stroke is hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding stroke. That's when a blood vessel is not blocked, but it breaks or tears, and blood leaks into the brain tissue or in the fluid spaces inside the head. It, that can additionally lead to brain, brain cell injury, brain cell death. And just like the blocked artery strokes, bleeding strokes or hemorrhagic strokes can be small or large. This is a picture test showing you what a small bleeding stroke looks like when patients come to the hospital and we take a CAT scan picture of their brain. You see in the middle of that picture there's a bright white circle. That's the area of bleeding and you see that it's relatively small in size compared to the rest of the brain. This is a small bleeding stroke that someone could recover fairly well from as long as the bleed, bleeding area does not increase in size. However, bleeding strokes can also be very large. Notice how large this area of white bleeding is in the middle of this CAT scan picture taken. This hemorrhagic stroke is quite large and is associated with a high chance of dying or permanent disability. What causes bleeding strokes? So unlike blocked artery strokes, which are often caused by uh, blood clots that block brain arteries or narrow brain arteries, bleeding strokes are often caused by breakage of arteries, either very small arteries uh, from long-standing high blood pressure or from larger areas of artery abnormalities, such as brain aneurysms. Brain aneurysms are weak areas of arteries that cause a ballooning uh, abnormality that grow over time and eventually can break. Another cause of bleeding strokes is from a rupture, a broken AVM. AVM stands for arteriovenous malformation and that represents an abnormal connection between an artery and a vein inside the brain. Fortunately, aneurysms and AVMs are treatable, but they are not as common as bleeding strokes due to high blood pressure where we have breakage of smaller arteries. This is a cartoon illustration showing you where such a small artery can break and lead to blood clot inside the brain tissue. Now, some strokes can be preceded by a warning sign. Um, that's what we call a TIA, or transient ischemic attack. So TIAs are a warning sign of a stroke, and these can often happen before a major blocked artery stroke. They don't have to happen before a, a major uh, stroke occurs, but they ca can commonly occur. And they are also are caused by blockage of blood flow to a part of the brain, but that blockage is only temporary, and the blood flow to the brain is only interrupted for a short period of time. 
so the symptoms of a TIA are very similar to a regular stroke, um, but the symptoms resolve in a matter of minutes to hours. TIAs are unfortunately also very common. We think close to a quarter of a million people in the United States a year will have a TIA or a warning sign of a stroke. Once somebody has a TIA, it increases their risk of stroke in the near future significantly. Uh, up to maybe 10 times as likely people are, are likely to have a stroke after having a TIA, especially within the first week to 30 days after that warning sign event. What are the warning signs of stroke or TIA? Well, sudden numbness or weakness on one side of the body, the face, the arm, the leg, or all of these um, can be a warning sign of stroke or TIA. But it doesn't have to be one side of the body. It could also be something like sudden confusion, sudden trouble speaking or understanding language, sudden trouble seeing out of one or both of your eyes, sudden uh, trouble walking, sudden severe dizziness, especially a spinning type of dizziness, or loss of balance or an inability to walk or discoordination of your body. Um, most strokes, especially the blocked artery types, are not associated with pain, are not associated with headache. So it differentiates from a heart attack where people can get crushing chest pain. Most stroke patients do not suffer pain. However, if someone gets a sudden severe worst headache of their life or a headache that they've never had before associated with severe vomiting or discomfort, that can be a sign of a bleeding stroke. One way to re remember what the warning signs or symptoms of stroke is, is to remember this acronym that's called BFAST. And it stands for balance, eyes, face, arm, speech, and time. So B for balance. If suddenly somebody uh, is unable to walk in a coordinated fashion or keep their balance, that could be a, a, a from stroke or TIA. E, e for eyes, if someone suddenly has visual loss in one or both of their eyes or part of the visual world, that can be a stroke. F for face, if suddenly somebody's face looks crooked or is unable to move, especially on one side, um, or they're unable to close their eye or smile on one side of their face, that can be a symptom of a stroke. Arm, if sudden, suddenly somebody has weakness of one of their arm, either the whole arm or a part of the arm, that can be a sign of a stroke. And I will show you what, one way to test for this. S for speech. If suddenly somebody's speech is very heavy or uh, difficult to understand, or they can't talk at all, or cannot understand what's being said to them, that could be a sign of a stroke. And then T for time. Stroke is a medical emergency, and we do have treatments for some many types of stroke, but we have to act quickly. And so the faster you can get to medical attention, if you're having a stroke, the much better, much greater your chances of having a better recovery. Uh, so how do we uh, assess whether we think somebody is having a stroke? Well, there are some simple things that you can do. You can look at somebody's face. If you think they're maybe having a stroke, you can ask them to show, show, them, show you their teeth or have them smile. Now normally both sides of the face will move equally. Um, if the face only moves on one side uh, of the body, that could be a sign of a stroke. This is a diagram showing you what this might look like when somebody's one side of their face is not moving. So the, the picture of the patient with the normal uh, symmetrical, symmetrical uh, mouth is not having a stroke. The person with the crooked, crooked looking mouth may be having a stroke. What about arm weakness? One thing you can ask people to do if you're worried about them having a stroke or a TIA is to ask them to raise both of their arms up and with or without closing their eyes. And normally we should be able to keep both of our arms up without one side falling down. But if someone is having a stroke affecting their arm strength, they may not be able to move one arm or the arm may drift quickly or slowly down being unable to be uh, held up. This is a picture showing you in the normal situation where uh, a woman here is, is, has good strength in both of her arms, but when asked to hold both of their arms up and she's having a stroke, you see that that uh, right arm on hers has drifted down or is unable to be lifted up. Speech. 
You can ask somebody that you're worried about that might be having a stroke to repeat a sentence, such as, the sky is blue in Cincinnati, or even something simpler than that. And if the patient can repeat exactly and their speech is very understandable, it's probably not a stroke involving speech or language. However, if the patient cannot repeat the sentence or you cannot understand what they're saying when normally you would be able to, uh, or they substitute incorrect words, that might be a worrisome sign for stroke. So what do you do if you do sus suspect a stroke in a loved one, a neighbor, yourself? Uh, you need to call 911 or have somebody close by Call 911. It's a medical emergency. And time lost is brain lost. So the faster you get to medical attention, the better the chances are of us diagnosing what the problem is and treating you and getting you the best possible brain recovery. So when you get to the hospital, if you are unfortunately suffering a stroke, what can we do? Well, for the most common stroke type, blocked artery strokes or ischemic strokes, as long as you come to us within four and a half hours, we can give you a medicine through an IV, um, which is a clot-breaking medicine. It's commonly referred to as TPA, and it is a clot-dissolving medicine that can dissolve blood clots that are blocking the blood flow from the, to the brain and reverse the brain damage that's occurring. But again, we can only give this drug safely and effectively within four and a half hours from when the stroke symptoms started or when the patient was last seen normal. Um, and we focus on trying to uh, give this drug in the right circumstances to patients within an hour of them coming to the, the emergency department. And we, do this, we can do this safely and very rapidly, but we need patients to come to the hospital uh, as quickly as it's suspected. You shouldn't wait to see if symptoms are getting better before calling 911. Uh, after somebody's had a blocked artery stroke, we also can give other medicines on a chronic basis to protect against future stroke, such as certain blood thinner pills like aspirin or warfarin or uh, other blood thinners. Um, and then occasionally we do other procedures such as a neck artery uh, opening surgery to uh, open up narrow neck arteries or even sometimes put stents inside people's arteries in their neck or their head to open up narrowed uh, blood vessels if they are causing additional strokes despite very good medical therapies. Uh, what about bleeding strokes? Can we treat bleeding strokes? Well, some of them, yes, we can treat very well, but they involve neurosurgery. Brain, rupture brain aneurysms we can treat. Um, even if the bleeding is quite severe, we have techniques both through open brain surgery and through minimally invasive surgery done through a tiny incision in the groin, we can treat ruptured brain aneurysms very well. Ruptured AVMs we can also treat with neurosurgical um, measures. Small ruptured arteries that are caused by high blood pressure, we can't, we don't have a surgery to treat many of them, but we, are, we can give good critical medical uh, care to these patients and increase their chances of surviving and having as little disability as possible. Here at Washington Hospital, we're proud to be a primary stroke center that's been certified by the Joint Commission for oh, well over a decade now, and we have received many awards for our uh, outstanding stroke care. Once patients have a stroke also, um, we encourage and offer rehabilitation services that start in the hospital, um, but often continue after discharge from the hospital, either in nursing facilities, rehab centers, or even as an outpatient or in the home. So to review what we've discussed about stroke today and what we've hoped that you've learned or reviewed about stroke is one, it's a major killer and disabler, unfortunately, worldwide and in America. We can detect it, and the earliest you can detect it, the better, because it is treatable, but the, the treatments are very time sensitive. Um, time is critical, uh, and stroke is a medical emergency. And it's important to know the signs of stroke. And this goes for all adults and even uh, children. Children should be educated about what warning signs of a stroke because sometimes adults having a stroke may not be able to, to, to recognize that they're having a stroke or call 911 for themselves. So all family members should, should be educated about what a stroke looks like. So again, the early sign, warning signs of stroke or stroke symptoms are sudden numbness, sudden confusion, 
trouble speaking or understanding language, trouble seeing out of one or both of the eyes, sudden weakness on one side of the body, trouble walking, sudden dizziness or room spinning, um, and then sudden severe headache unlike you've ever had before. And remember and, and, and teach others this mnemonic, be fast. So if you suspect a stroke, remember, don't try to diagnose the, the problem yourself. Call 911 immediately. Don't drive yourself or a loved one or a neighbor to the hospital. Call 911. And we're very equipped here at the hospital, at Washington Hospital, as are other stroke centers across the Bay Area and throughout the country to diagnose and treat stroke. And for more information, we have a lot of uh, good information on our website, which you can access by clicking on www.whhs.com backslash stroke. And we'll have time for questions at the end. Please type them into the chat box, and I will be happy to answer questions towards the end. But I want to turn it over to my colleague for the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Now I would like to introduce nurse practitioner Maria Nunes. Maria is the clinical manager of the stroke program at Washington Hospital. Welcome, Maria. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Thank you, Dr. Rose, for introducing this very important topic and discussing the warning, uh, the warning signs and the history behind stroke. With that said, I am here to discuss the prevention of stroke. So, as you can see, we should, we've had a little bit of uh, information um, on um, the warning signs, um, the etiology around stroke. So with that said, uh, what is the prevention and can strokes be prevented? Yes, strokes are preventable if you have knowledge of the risk factors because you can control those risk factors. And I'm here to discuss some of these risk factors in that and the strategies that are associated with those risk factors. So some of the risk factors that are uh, controllable are hypertension, high cholesterol, smoking, a deadly rhythm called atrial fibrillation, and heavy alcohol use. This diagram over here will show you how many strokes could be prevented. As you can see on the screen, hypertension is the number one that can be prevented. There's 300, and this is estimated on a total of 699,000 strokes. Hypertension amounts to 360,000 that could have been prevented. Cholesterol comes in next with 146,000. You can also see smoking and atrial fibrillation. So the most important goal over here is if you look at these conditions like high blood pressure, cholesterol, what, what amounts to is if you see your doctor regularly, take high blood pressure medication as ordered, take your blood pressure at home, keep your weight down, these are some of the preventions that you can do to uh, reduce the risk factors. I have up here on the screen the incidence of stroke. Somebody who has high blood pressure and somebody without this condition. So as you can see, the condition, a uh, high blood pressure without, without high blood pressure is much less. It increases stroke risk factor by, by 340. As also in atrial fibrillation, which is really high, you can see that somebody who has that um, atrial fibrillation and is uncontrolled can increase their risk, risk by 480. Now, let's talk about what we could do towards uh, prevention. I'm here to talk about change. So change is difficult. And why is that so? Because we're all set in our ways. Patterns in life are a part of what defines us. We know when we know uh, there is comfort and security in what we know and what we want to do. So we continue doing that. Sometimes it's a matter of deficit of knowledge. We do not even know that there could be another way to do something. And at times, it's also motivation. We lack the motivation 
because of also knowledge deficit. So therefore, to, to make some choices, what would be important? It would be the knowledge, the motivation, and the creativity. That would equate into change. So therefore, change would occur only when you understand what choices you have over here for you. And so that's what we're here to talk about. Before I go into that, I also want to point out the uncontrollable risk factors. And some of them are age, gender, hereditary and race, and history. And you heard this with Dr. Rose's presentation earlier on. So we can do what we can do. And therefore, controlling the controllable risk factors is what we're going to discuss about. And some of them would include smoking, excessive use of alcohol, high blood pressure, sedentary lifestyle, diabetes, stress, and so forth. Let's begin with excessive body weight. So this is one controllable risk factor. As you're all aware, there's millions of diets around. But the key concepts is reducing portions, reducing your caloric intake. It's very important to throw in some activity. Walking is a great one. When you're thinking about diets, you want to keep in mind to avoid the crash diets. It's great to plan to lose one to two pounds a week. As a part of excessive body weight uh, strategies, which we will discuss a little bit more. One of them is to avoid high sugars and high fat foods. Meal planning always helps because you know what is going into your food. So some of the healthy tips would be, whenever you have to eat something on the run or you have to stand up and eat, that's always equating to snacks. And as you will see, as we go on a little bit more into this, into this presentation, that um, snacks tend to have high trans fats and other sodium. And so this is one way that you could, you could avoid by having a meal that is prepared ahead of time. It's also important to read labels. And when you're reading labels, you would want to pay attention to the caloric intake to the serving size. When you read labels and it says that it's the serving size is two third equating into this amount of calories, you might want to remember that if you have more than that two third cup, you're increasing your caloric intake. So with that said, there's other, um, there's other components to reading labels and we'll go in into it as we discuss hypertension and so forth. Also, when you think about snacks, you always want to think about a piece of fruit or vegetable instead of high caloric, um, low nutritional value snacks like cookies and candies and soft drinks, etc. One of the way of um, uh, eating in excessive uh, losing weight is always to share walks or recipes and ideas. Here on the screen, you can see the prevalence of obesity among U.S. adults aged 20 to 74. And as you can see from 1960 onwards till 2010, we've increased to 35.9%. And the projected um, obesity rate would be 50% by the time it's to 2030. So with that said, weight reduction has, has a very important part in, in stroke. Because with weight reduction, you could take care of some of these deadly disease that we have, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. Therefore, losing weight would be the most important intervention you can make to avoid stroke. Let's go into smoking. As we all know, smoking or even secondary smoking doubles your risk of stroke. So it's two to four times fold increase in hemorrhagic stroke. Plus, women that smoke and also use contraceptives increase their risk by seven times. That also applies for passive smoking. So if you live with somebody or with a spouse who smokes, what could you do? Well, one of the most important things for smoking is getting your physician to help you because 
there's ways that you could be on prescribed oral medications. You could have nicotine gum, transdermal patches. There's also a helpline, California Smokers Helpline, 1-800-NO-BUTS. Some of the tips, healthy tips around would be if you do live with somebody who smokes and you smoke, make a pact to quit together. Chew gum if that helps. Also avoid situations where you might want to smoke, like getting into a bar, getting up right away after dinner and going to smoke. It's a habit for some people. Or do something else. Uh, try to take a walk or so. The next one is alcohol and drug use. American Heart Association recommends, of course, if you don't drink, don't start it now. If you do drink, you limit your drinking. Men, less than two drinks per day. Women, less than one drink per day. So when you mean uh, uh, two drinks, I'm talking about beer, 12 ounces. I'm talking about wine, five and a half ounces, and hard liquor, one and a half ounce. So if you do drink more than two drinks or women more than one drink, you might want to reduce your consumption because excessive drinking always leads to increased fats and it can, it can lead you into hypertension and heart failure, etc. What are some of the healthy tips? One of them would be if you have to socialize with friends that use drugs or drink or excessive, uh, use it in excessive amounts, you might want to make a healthy choice. You might want to limit your use with those friends, um, outings with those friends. These are, you know, drugs and alcohol are always habits. And so you might want to change your habits. Instead of going to a bar, you might want to socialize in a coffee shop, or you might want to uh, meet in a park, or you might want to meet at a gym. There's plenty of free organizations that can help you, like the uh, Alcoholic uh, Anonymous, the um, American Stroke Association, etc. Now let's get into some of the disease, some of uh, the disease that uh, directly contribute to stroke. One of it that said, as I had mentioned, hypertension is the big one. American Stroke Association suggests that almost half of strokes can be prevented by controlling your blood pressure. So ASA, that is American Stroke Association, recommendation is you got to keep your blood pressure less than 120 over 80, and particularly more so with diabetes, because this is the most profound risk factor that you could uh, modify to avoid stroke. I cannot stress more on this. Only 54% of people with hypertension have their conditions under control. This is a problem. 65 of American adults are overweight or obese, which is directly associated with hypertension. So what could you do to bring your blood pressure down? Of course, one of the most important thing is aerobic exercise. It is a known fact that exercise can help you, can help reduce blood pressure along with weight loss. And low sodium diets, which we will be going on and giving you strategies on what are low sodium diets, uh, what are some of the foods that contribute to low sodium diets, and above all, the medications prescribed by your physician. It is very important to continue your medication and take your medication and refill your medications timely. Some of the healthy tips could be, you might want to take off the salt shaker from the table. So no added salt. You got to choose your foods wisely. Canned foods, processed foods tend to have a lot of salt added um, to keep the shelf life. So you want to stay away from those foods. Losing weight, like we said. When you read, um, when you read label, pay special attention to the sodium content on the food, um, on that particular food. Buy a blood pressure machine will help you record and monitor your blood pressure regularly. Also, keep healthy snacks around. Instead of uh, binging on cookies, chips, and so forth that have high content of salt and sodium, you might want to eat some fruit or some vegetable, hummus. Don't eat 
anything while you're, while you're on the run or standing. And basically what that means is you tend to grab snacks when you do that. So that's one, one of the strategies that you could use. Join a group, start a healthy cooking class with your friends. And of course, like I said, learn to read the labels. So it's important that you look at the salt content um, uh, in, in those foods. Next, one of the controllable is you could avoid a sedentary lifestyle. So ASA recommends at least 30 minutes of aerobic exercises. It, exercise does a lot of good stuff. It helps you lose weight, improve your cholesterol, reduce your stress, reduces blood pressure. And so with that, you would want, what are some of the choices that you could do? You'd want to go for a dinner after walk, learn some new leisure activities. Remember, when you get strong and you lose weight, there's always a bonus. You feel great and you look great. The other disease that we're going to, uh, which, which could, is control, controllable risk factor is diabetes. You have 29.1 million Americans diagnosed um, with diabetes. 8.1 million have been undiagnosed with diabetes. 86 million Americans will be pre-diabetic, which means their fasting blood sugar is 100 to 126. And 69,000 Americans die of diabetes. At least 65% of people with diabetes will die of some form of heart or blood, blood vessel disease, as in stroke. I just gave you this um, graph to see that we, we have to get this under control because it's really out of control. If you can see in 2010, we were at 25.8% and we've shot up by 2012 in two years to 29.1% and it's only getting worse. So why is this so important? Why is keeping diabetes under control so important? Because you can minimize the negative effects of diabetes. Um, uh, you can achieve near to normal blood sugars, very important since we said that they're directly related with stroke. So you wanna, sh you wanna keep a goal. The International Diabetes Center guidelines suggest that you keep blood sugar goal before meals 70 to 120 and blood sugar goals um, two hours after your meals less than 160. What are some of the strategies or healthy tips you could do? Remember, this is a very complex disease, and this would require uh, help from your physician, from a dietitian, and you have to really be able to manage this in conjunction with your physician and, your, and with, with the help of a dietitian. There are sites that we have up on the screen, example, www.diabetes.org or www. Uh, dot international diabetes center, um, dot com or um, American Heart Organization or Stroke Association um, that can help you get some more strategies and learn a little bit more about diabetes and strategies. Finally, we'll also go into s stress. This one is a hard one to measure. So probably if you think you're stressed, you are, you are stressed. American Stroke Association says that people who said that they were highly stressed have a greater risk of fatal strokes than people who said they were stress-free. So as you can see, stress always doubles the risk. What are some things you could do? Take a break, get a physical activity, make it a point every 15 minutes to do something that you really enjoy. You can reflect, meditate, take some yoga classes, anything that can de-stress you. Now that we've reviewed the risk factors, we understand that some of these factors just cannot be changed, like age, hereditary, race, so forth. But we can definitely change and treat and control the other ones like high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, diabetes, our diet, stress, alcohol, excessive alcohol use, and so forth, and atrial fibrillation. You can, you can take medications, and you have to be on top of your medications for atrial fibrillation, which is, again, a deadly, fast rhythm. I just want to go ahead and um, reinforce the signs of stroke. So when it comes up to stroke, as Dr. Rose had mentioned, we use the mnemonic, be fast. 
and he did go into um, what BFAST stands for. And please call 911 because um, stroke is an emergency. To learn a little bit more about stroke, we, you can also go to www.strokeassociation.org or call 1-888-4-STROKE. Finally, stroke can be prevented by using the knowledge we've gained today and making smart choices to develop the motivation for change to a healthy lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Now we're, we welcome questions from both, for both Maria and Dr. Rose. Our first question is, what is the worst risk factor for a stroke? Well, the most common risk factor for stroke, both blocked artery strokes and bleeding strokes, is hypertension or high blood pressure, just like uh, Maria went over. Um, and the problem with high blood pressure is we, or hypertension is we sometimes call it the silent killer because sometimes often people can have high blood pressure for a long period of time and not know that they have it. And so that's why it's important to go to your physician or healthcare provider regularly and to have your blood pressure checked. Um, so hypertension is, is probably the, the most important and common risk factor for both blocked artery strokes and bleeding strokes. Um, but it is very tr controllable. Nowadays, we have many uh, strategies to control people's high blood pressure with lifestyle changes and sometimes medications. Um, and the, the other most uh, uh, common risk factor besides the other uh, things that Maria um, went over, like diabetes and high cholesterol and obesity, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, alcohol use, etc., is age. Um, the older you are, the more likely you are to have a stroke, especially for blocked artery strokes. But we do see patients that are young that have stroke, and so it's not only a disease of older people. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, what are the most important things to look at on food labels? I can go ahead and take that one. So one of the most important things like we discussed, uh, what, what I said is the caloric intake. So you want to stay with the uh, caloric intake that is prescribed for you. Now this is important when you're losing weight because um, you want to read the amount of calories that are written in a serving. And like I said, you want to sp play special importance to that because if you take more than that serving, you're increasing your calorie intake. The other one that you also look at is the um, fats, it's the saturated and the trans fats. And I want to speak a little bit about that because you want to keep the fats less than 25% of the caloric intake. And you also want to look for the trans fats because the trans fats are hidden. And sometimes, even if it's written zero on trans fats, they could be some of the um, less than one fourth because the labels don't have to mention anything less than one fourth. So you want to pay attention to the fats. And the third, third one that you would want to read the label on for hypertension is the sodium content, like I had mentioned. And you might want to talk with your doctor as to what, depending on other conditions associated with you, what your sodium consumption should be. But you need to keep that low. Very good. Thank you, Maria. Uh, the next question we have is, after a stroke, can the brain repair itself? That's an excellent question. Um, so, so after somebody uh, has a stroke, um, part of the brain can, can often be permanently injured, um, but the patient can recover fully or incompletely, but it's not because that part of the brain that got injured re actually re recovers or regenerates itself. Other parts of the brain have to take over the job of the injured area, and that's why it can sometimes take time, days, weeks, months, sometimes even years for someone to recover from a stroke. Other parts of their brain have to take over the job of the injured, permanently injured area. 
and that takes time and rehabilitation. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I live alone. What would be the best way of knowing if I'm having a stroke? Well, Maria and I uh, went through um, the easy way to remember what this, the warning signs or the common symptoms of stroke are, and that's to remember this uh, mnemonic or this acronym, Be Fast. So remember, balance, eyes, face, arm, speech, and time. So if suddenly you have a problem with balance or suddenly someone next to you can't uh, maintain their balance, that is a warning sign of a, of a stroke. And E for eyes, sudden visual impairment, especially sudden visual loss of one eye or, or one por portion of the visual world, that could be a, a sign that somebody's having a stroke. F for the face, if suddenly one side of your face is not moving uh, or you can't feel one side of your face, that is a sign of a potential stroke. Arm, if you suddenly can't move one of your arms or suddenly it goes completely numb, um, that is a warning sign of a stroke. Um, S for speech, if suddenly you can't speak well or clearly or you can't understand language or the person that you're worried about is not communicating effectively or clearly, that is a sign that a stroke might be occurring. Um, and then T uh, for time, if you are worried about you or a, a someone next to you is having a stroke, remember that you need to call 911 and get to medical attention quickly. And that's the, the, the most common way to remember the warning signs for blocked artery strokes. And in terms of bleeding strokes, you also want to watch out for a sudden, unexplained, worst headache that you've ever experienced in your life, especially headaches associated with uh, uh, severe nausea and vomiting, uh, which if that's atypical for you, that could be a sign of a bleeding stroke. Okay, and our last question, what is the difference between a stroke and a TIA? I can go ahead and answer that. So with the TIA, it's as it says in the name, transient ischemic attack. It it can, it can, the symptoms can disappear uh, within, within 24 hours. So that is the key, uh, key dis, um, and Dr. Rose had already mentioned that when he was discussing um, so the symptoms of stroke um, as in a TIA can, can, can be a way, like you, you can, those symptoms can disappear between uh, two to, uh, between, before 24 hours. So that would be one of the, that's how you would be able to dis differentiate. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions today. And this concludes our program. Thank you, Dr. Rose and Maria for this insightful presentation. And thank you viewers for tuning in. The entire broadcast of today's event will be available on our Facebook page and YouTube.